ഓക്കെ വെൽക്കം ടു ദിസ് വർക്ക്ഷോപ്പ് നമ്പർ എയ്റ്റി സിക്സ് അറ്റ് ദിസ് ഹാൾ ഇറ്റ്സ് വെരി പ്ലേജർ ടു ബി ഹിയർ ഡിസ്കസിംഗ് അബൌട്ട് ആർട്ടിഫിഷ്യൽ ഇൻ്റലിജൻസ് ആൻഡ് സൈബർ ഡിഫെൻസ് especially from developing country perspective this is bauram areal and by profession i'm a lawyer and i've been uh, engaged in various uh, law and technology issues from nepal and i'd like to introduce very briefly uh, my uh, panelist this evening uh, mr sarim is from meta and he leads uh, meta south asia policy uh, team and uh, significantly engaged in ai uh, and policy and technology issues and he will be representing uh, this panel from business perspective and my colleague is uh, vakas hasan he is uh, lead of international affairs of pakistan telecommunication authority pakistan and he is engaged in regulatory perspective and he will be sharing regional uh, and and uh, of course from pakistan perspective on regulatory uh, perspective and my colleague uh, michael is from zambia and he is uh, cyber uh, analyst and he is investigator in cyber crime and he will be representing from um, law enforcement agency and dr tatiana tropina uh, is uh, uh, assist- assistant professor from leiden university and she will be uh, uh, representing policy perspective especially from european perspective so artificial intelligence has given very uh, significant opportunity for all of us it has now become a big uh, world though it's not a new one but recently it has become very uh, popular uh, uh, tools and technology and uh, lots of uh, threats uh, also have posed by uh, the contribution of uh, uh, technology of artificial intelligence at this uh, panel we'll be discussing how artificial intelligence uh, could be uh, beneficial in uh, especially cyber security perspective uh, or defense perspective and uh, also uh, how we can uh, discuss on the framework of uh, defense side on pos- potential risk of artificial intelligence in cyber security cyber crime mitigation of this kind of issues i'll g- go to uh, directly with uh, michael who is uh, uh, experiencing directly various uh, risk and threats and handling uh, cyber crime cases in zambia and uh, michael uh, please share your uh, experience and and the perspective especially you have been uh, very engaged in uh, igf perspective i know you have been mag member and and uh, um, engaged in african uh, continent as well um, floor is yours michael uh, good afternoon and good morning and good evening i know the time zone for japan is literally difficult for most of us who are not from this region so of course in africa it's morning in south america it's it's probably in the evenings so all protocols observed so basically i am a law enforcement officer working for zambia police service and uh, the cyber crime unit uh, in terms of uh, the current uh, crime landscape we've seen an increase in terms of crime that are technology enabled we've seen crimes that you wouldn't hope like expect that such a thing would happen but at the end of it all we've come to discover that most of these crimes that have been committed are enabled by ai i'll give an example if um we take a person who's never been to college or who's never done any computing uh course is able to program a computer malware or a computer program that they are using it for their criminal intent you would ask what skills have they got for them to execute such or we've come to understand this everything has always been enabled by ai especially with the coming of chat gpt and other ai based tools online which basically are free 
with their time on hand, they will be able to come up with something that they may execute in their criminal activities. So this itself has posed a serious challenge for law enforcers, especially on the African continent and mostly to developing countries. Beyond that, of course, we handle cases, we handle matters where you, it does become difficult to distinguish a human element and an artificial intelligence generated, whether it's an image, whether it's a video, so as a result, when such cases go to court or when we arrest such perpetrators, it's, it's, there's a slightly, like, it's a gray area on our part because the, the, the AI technology are able to do much, much more and much, much faster than the human can comprehend. So as a result, from the law enforcement perspective, I think AI has caused some, a bit of some challenges. What, what kind of challenges you have experienced? Uh, what kind of challenges you have experienced as a law enforcement agency significantly? So basically, um, it comes to the use of uh, digital forensic tools. Like, I'll give an example. A video can be generated that would appear to be genuine and everyone else would believe it, and yet it is not. You can have cases where, which have to do with freedom of expression, where somebody's voice has been copied, and if you literally listen to it, you'd believe that indeed this is a person who has been issuing this statement, when in fact not. So even emails, you can receive an email that genuinely seems to come from a genuine source, and yet probably it's been AI written and uh, everything points out to an individual or to an organization, at the end of the day, as you receive it, you have trust in it. So basically, there are many, many, many areas. Each and every day, we are learning some new challenges and new opportunities for us to probably catch up with the use of AI in our policing and day-to-day uh, -day activities as we also try to distinguish AI activities and human interaction activities. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'll come to uh, Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana is a researcher and significantly engaged in cybersecurity policy development. And as a researcher, as a, uh, uh, how you see the development of AI, especially in cybersecurity issues, and, and as you represent uh, in our panel from European uh, stakeholders, so what is the European uh, position on this kind of uh, issues uh, from policy perspective, uh, policy frameworks, what kind of issues are being uh, dealt by European uh, countries and Tatiana? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I do believe that in a way um, the threat and the opportunity that artificial intelligence brings for cybersecurity or security in general, like let's say if we put it as protection from harm, would, might be almost the same everywhere, but the European Union indeed is trying to sort of deal with them and foresee them in a manner um, that would address the risks and harms. And I know that the big discussion in the policy community circles and also in academic circles is not the question anymore whether we need to regulate AI um, for the purpose of security and cybersecurity or whether we do not. The question is how do we do this? How do we do, um, how do we protect uh, people and also systems and uh, like kind of uh, from harm while not stifling innovation. And I do believe that right now there are two approaches that I discussed, or not two, but mostly, you know, we are targeting two things. Uh, the risk-based regulation. So when the new AI systems are going to be developed, the risk is going to be assessed and then based on risk, regulation will either be there or not. And outcome-based regulation. You want to create some framework um, of what you want to achieve and then give industry some ability to achieve it by their own means as long as you protect from harm. But I do believe, and I would like to, to, to um, second what the previous speaker said, from the the law enforcement perspective, from crime perspective, the challenges are so many that sometimes we are looking at them and we are getting sort of 
how do I say it? Not, not our judgment is clouded, but we have to do two things. We have to address the current challenges. Why foresee the future challenges, right? So um, I do believe that right now we are talking a lot about risks from uh, large language models. Um, a generation of spare phishing campaigns, um, a generation of malware, and this is something that right now is already happening and it's hard to regulate. But if we are looking to the future, we have to address a few things in terms of cybersecurity and risks. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, uh, the the AI, bi AI bias, the accountability and transparency of algorithms. Um, we have to address the issues of deep fakes, and here it goes even beyond cybersecurity. It goes to information operations uh, into the field of national security. So this is just my baseline, and I'm happy to go into further discussions on this. Thank you, uh, Tatiana. Now. Uh, at the uh, initial uh, remarks, I'll come to uh, Salim. And uh, from an industry uh, player, uh, Meta is one of uh, very significant player, and Meta platform is also a platform that uh, is very popular, as well as there are many uh, risk uh, Meta uh, platform where complained and not only Meta platform, uh, you are uh, just here, that's why I, I mentioned, but uh, these platforms are uh, sometimes uh, many uh, countries, they have complaints and they are not contributing, they are just doing business and, and technologies are being misused by people and, and, and the bad people. So uh, there are a uh, few things like uh, uh, business uh, perspective, uh, technology perspective as well, as a social perspective. So as a, uh, as a uh, technology industry player, how uh, you see uh, the risk and opportunity of uh, artificial intelligence, especially uh, the topic that we have been discussing, and uh, what could be uh, the response uh, from industry uh, on, on addressing these kind of issues? Sorry. Thank you, Babu, for the opportunity. I think this is a very timely topic. There's been a lot of debate around sort of, uh, you know, opportunities with AI and excitement around it, but also challenges and risks as, as our speakers have highlighted. Uh, I think I just want to reframe this discussion from a different perspective. You know, from our perspective, we do see, um, you know, the, 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 we have to actually understand the threat actors we're kind of dealing with. They are quite can sometimes be using quite simple methods to uh, evade detection, but sometimes can use very sophisticated methods, AI being one of them. Um, you know, we have a cybersecurity team at Meta that's been trying to stay ahead of the curve uh, of these threat actors. And, you know, we have, I want to point to a sort of a, a tool, which is like our uh, adversarial th qu uh, threat report, which we produce quarterly. And that's just a great uh, information tool out there just for, for policy tool as well to understand the trends of what's going on. This is where we report on uh, in-depth analysis of influence operations that we see around the world, uh, you know, especially around coordinated inauthentic behavior. Right? If you think about the issues we're discussing here around cybersecurity, a lot of that has to do with inauthentic behavior, someone who's trying to appear authentic, whether you know, from a phishing email to a, uh, to a uh, you know, message you might receive and, and hacking attempts and other things. So, um, so that threat report is a great tool, just to, and that's something we, we do on a quarterly basis. We've been doing that for a long time. We also did a, a state of influence ops report between 2017 and 20 that shows the trends of how sophisticated these actors are. But from our perspective, you know, I think we've seen three things with, with AI uh, if, from a risk perspective uh, that honestly does not concern us as much. I'll explain why. Because one is, yes, like as Michael mentioned, you know, the, the most typical use case is AI-generated photos and you to try to appear like you're a real profile, right? But frankly, if you think about it, that was happening even before AI. In fact, most of the actions that we were taking um, with, on accounts that were fake previously all had profile photos. It's not like they didn't have a photo. So whether that photo is a, a generated by AI or a real person shouldn't matter because it's actually about the behavior. And I think that's my main point is that I think the challenge with Gen AI is that we get a little bit stuck on the content. 
and we need to change the conversation about how do we detect bad behavior, right? And so that's one. Second thing we notice is that because of Gen AI being the, the hype cycle, the, you know, the fact that it's almost every session here at IGF is about AI, it, you know, it becomes an easy target for phishing and scams because all, all you need to do is say, hey, click on this to access chat GPT for free. And people are, because they've heard of AI, they think it's cool, they're more willing to get duped into those kinds of sort of hype cycles, which is common with things like AI and other things. The third is like we, as I think Michael also alluded to this uh, and Tatiana as well, that there, it does make it a little bit easier for, especially I would say non-English speakers who want to scam others to use Gen AI to, you know, whether you want to make ransomware or malware to make it easier because now you've got a tool that'll help you fix your language and make it look all pretty. Uh, so it's like, okay, it's a, you've got a very nice auto-complete spell checker <laughs> that, that can make sure your things are well-written. So those are sort of the three high-level threats, but honestly, well, what I would say is that we haven't seen a major difference in an enforcement, and, and I'll give you an example. Uh, in quarter one of this year, we, in, in, we also have a transparency report where we report on, we measure ourselves and how good is our AI, and, and I think that's the point I'm trying to get to, is that we are more excited about the opportunities AI brings in cybersecurity and, and helping cyber defenders and, and helping people keep safe versus the risks, and, and this is one example. 99.7% of the fake accounts that we removed in quarter one of this year on Facebook were removed by AI. And if I give you that number, it's staggering. It's 676 million accounts were removed in just one quarter by AI alone, right? That's the scale. So when you talk about scale detection, and it has nothing to do with content, I just wanna bring it back to that. What we detected was uh, inauthentic behavior, fake behavior. It shouldn't matter whether your profile photo was from ChatGPT or it doesn't matter, or your text. Because you, once you get into the content, you're getting into a weeds of what is the intent. And you don't know the intent, right? Whether it's real or... Uh, and in fact, I'll also point to the fact that some of the worst videos, you talked about fake videos, are actually not the Gen AI ones. If you look at the ones that went the most viral, they are real videos. And it's the simplest manipulations that have uh, fooled people. So uh, I'm pointing to the... U.S. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, her video that went viral, all that they did was they slowed it down. And they didn't use any AI for that. And that had the most negative, like the highest impact because people believed that there was a problem, right, with, 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 with the individual, which clearly wasn't the case. It was an edited video. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the bad actors find a way to use these tools um, and, and they will find any tool that's out there, but I think so we really have to get focus on the behavior and detection piece, and I can get into that more. Um, that's it for now. Thanks, Sarim. It's, it's very uh, encouraging uh, thing that 99% fake uh, accounts are removed by AI. And what about uh, reverse situation? Is there any intervention from AI on uh, negative side in your platform? No, like I said, I, I mentioned the three... Uh, uh, areas obviously when we get into large language models you know I, we, I also want to make the point that we believe the solution here uh, and going into solutions a bit early but is that more people in the cybersecurity space people who uh, you know we talk, talk about amplifying the good we need to use it for good and use it for keeping people safe and and we can do that through open innovation and open approach and collaboration right so uh, of course the risks are there but if you if you keep something closed and you only give it access to a few companies or a few individuals, then bad actors will find a way to get, any, get it anyway and they will use it for bad purposes. But if you make sure it's accessible and open for cybersecurity experts, for the community, then I think you can use open innovation to really make sure the cyber defenders are using the technology to improving it. And, and this 99.7 this is an example of that. I mean, we, you know, we open source a lot of our AI technology actually for, for communities and for developers and other platforms to use as well. I'll, I'll uh, come back uh, to you on next round of uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, you are uh, at very hot seat. Uh, I know uh, regulatory agencies are facing lots of challenge by um, technology, and now uh, well, telecom regulators have uh, very uh, big roles on, on mitigating uh, risk of uh, uh, AI and, and telecommunication and, and all, uh, of course, internet. So uh, uh, from your perspective, 
what you see is the major issue as a regulator or as a government when uh, artificial intelligence is uh, challenging uh, the platform in, in the way that people are uh, feeling risk and, and of course uh, from your uh, Pakistani perspective as well and, and uh, how uh, you dealt uh, in this kind of uh, situation in your, your country. Can you uh, say some lights on this? Yeah, thank, thanks Babu. Um, actually thanks for setting up the context for my initial remarks here because you already said that you know I'm in a hot seat. Um, even now I'm in the middle of uh, you know my platform, uh, the police and the researcher <laughs> even at this seating. Uh, with, with regulators it's a bit of a tricky job because at one hand we are connected with the industry. On the other hand we are directly connected with the consumers as well. Uh, this is this is more like a um, this is more like a job where you have to do the balancing act whenever you're taking any decisions or any moving forward on anything. With with cybersecurity itself being a major challenge for developing countries for so long, uh, this new mix of AI has actually made things more uh, more challenging. Uh, you see, the technology is usually uh, and primarily and inherently. Uh, has been developed in the West. Uh, and that technology being developed in the West means uh, that we have, a, we have a first mover disadvantage for developing countries as well because we're already lacking um, on the technology transfer part. What happens is that once, uh, that because of internet and because of how we are connected these days, um, it is much easier to get any information which could be positive or negative. And usually the cybersecurity threats or the, or, 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 um, or the elements that are engaged in some kind, such kind of cyber crimes and all, they're usually ahead of the curve when it comes to defenses. Defense will always be reactive. And for developing countries, we have always been in a reactive mode. Meta has just mentioned that you know um, their AI model or their AI project has been able to bring down the fake accounts on Facebook within one quarter by 99.7 percent. That means that they do have such an advanced or such a uh, tech-savvy technology available to them or, uh, or, or, or resources available to them that they were able to do to achieve this huge and absolutely tremendous milestone by the way. But can you imagine something like this or some, some solution like this uh, in the hands of a developing country um, with that kind of investment uh, to, to, to deploy something like this which can actually you know, serve, as a, serve as a dome or a cyber security net around your country? That's, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So what does it come down to then for us as regulators? It comes down to... Number one, uh, removing that inherent fear of AI, which we have in the developing countries. Uh, although it is absolutely tremendous to see how AI has been doing, uh, bringing in positive things, but that inherent fear of any new technology is still there. This is more related to behavior, what, which, which Sarim was mentioning. And I think it also boils down to one more point, which is intention. I think intention is what leads towards anything, uh, whether in it is on cyberspace or, in, or, in, or, or, or off the cyberspace. I think what developing countries need to tackle this new uh, form of cybersecurity, I would call it, with the, with, the, with, the, with the mix of AI, is to have more capacity, is to have more institutional capacity, is to have more human capacity, is to, f is to have, a, have, a, have a national collaborative approach which is driven by, uh, which is driven by something uh, like, a, like a common agenda of how to actually go about it. We are so disjointed even our, on our, um, in, our, in our national efforts for a secure cyberspace that doing something on a regional level is, seems like a far sight to me right now. So to, to just, just to sum it up, 
for example, in Pakistan, we have a national cybersecurity policy as well. We do have a national center for cybersecurity. Um, we have, PTA has re issued regulations on critical telecom and infrastructure protection. Uh, we do in threat intelligence sharing as well. There is a national telecom cert as well. There are so many things that we are doing, but if I see the trend, that trend is more like last three, four years maybe where things have actually started to come out. But imagine if this, these things were happening 10 years back, we would have been much more prepared to tackle AI now into our cybersecurity postures. So uh, from, a, from a governance or a, or a cybersecurity or from a, from, a, from a regulatory perspective, it is more about uh, how, we, how we tackle these, these new challenges with a more collaborative approach and looking at you know, more developed countries for kind of technology transfer and for and to build institutional capacity to address these challenges. Yeah. Thank you. I'll end with it. Thank you, Akash. <coughs> Actually, I was supposed to come on uh, capacity, and uh, Akash, you just mentioned the capacity building of uh, people. Uh, Tatiana, I would like to uh, uh, come with you uh, that how much. Uh, uh, investment on uh, policy frameworks uh, and capacity buildings uh, uh, coming uh, in uh, framing law and ethical issues in, in uh, artificial intelligence and whether uh, industries are contributing uh, to, to manage uh, these things and, and also from government side. So, uh, uh, what is the level of capacity uh, uh, on policy research on framing uh, artificial, in, uh, I mean, um, uh, framing the uh, way out for um, these uh, uh, artificial intelligence and legal issues? Uh, it's working, right? Uh, thank you very much for the question. And I must admit, so I've heard the, I, I've heard the word in investment. I'm not an economist, so I'm going to, take, <laughs> to talk about people, hours, efforts, and whatever. So first of all, when it comes to security, defense, or regulation, we, um, I think we need to understand that to address anything and to create future frameworks, we need to understand the threat first, right? So we need to invest in understanding threats. And here it's not only, and I think I mentioned this before, it's not only about harms as we see it, for example, harm from crime, harm from deep fakes. It's also harm that is caused by bias, but ethical issue, because the artificial intelligence model is only as good as brings it brings as much good as the model itself, the information you feed it, the final outcome. And we know already, and I think that this is incredibly important for developing countries to remember that AI can be biased. And technologies created in the West can be double biased once technology transfer and adoption happens somewhere else. For example, I, when, when, when I've heard about Meta removing accounts based on behavioral patterns, I really would like to know how these models are trained. Be it content, be it language, be it behavioral pattern, does it take into account cultural differences between language, countries, continents, and whatever? And here, here, I do believe that what we talk about in terms of cooperation between industry, researchers, and governments, and law enforcement is crucial. Just a few examples. Um, scrutiny, external scrutiny of algorithms, and I believe that both industry, government, or not both, three of you will agree with me, that it is incredibly important once the algorithm is created and trained to open it for scrutiny from civil society, from research organizations, because um, you need somebody to see if it's ethical from the outside. You know, to me, testing algorithms just by adopting them ethically is the same as testing medicine or cosmetic on animals. We don't do this anymore. So it's, it's not only building capacity itself, it's adopting a completely new mindset, how we are going to do this. And in terms of investment in creation of future-proof frameworks, you really need to see the, the 
the whole picture and then see, okay, what kind of threats I'm addressing today and what kind of threats I might foresee tomorrow. And this is why I was talking about uh, of sort of, it is hard to think about future-proof frameworks because indeed defense will always be a bit behind. But if you forget about technology itself, technology can change tomorrow, but you can think about how you frame harms. What do you want to achieve in your innovation? And then say, okay, meta, I want to achieve this level of safety. If you see this risk, please provide this safety. And leave it to meta and make meta opening this also for external research. And this cooperation might bring you somewhere to the point where it would be more ethical, where it would be more... Um, for good in terms of defense. And I also want to say the existential fear of AI exists everywhere, I believe. And this is why every second session here is about AI, just because we are so scared. But I also do believe that we cannot stop what is going on. We really have to invest in here. I'm talking again not about money, but about uh, people. Um, and also, if I may, if I haven't spoken for too long yet, I think that there are so many issues here that we have to detangle. And again, look at harms and look at algorithm itself. For example, the use of algorithm in creation of spare phishing campaigns or malware. We know how to address it. We need to work with prompt engineers because it creates malware, malware only as good as the prompt you, ha you, you give it. And if a year ago you could say to chat GPT, just create me a piece of malware or, or, or ransomware, and it will do it. Now you cannot do this. You need to split it at, at in, into many, many prompts. So we have to, to make this untenable for criminals. We have to make sure that every tiny prompt, every tiny step that can, they can execute in creation of this, or of this malware by algorithm will be stopped. And yes, it is work, but this is work we can do. And so with any other harm. Sorry for speaking for too long. Thank no, you. Okay. It's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you very much uh, bringing uh, more issues in the table. Uh, sorry. There was very uh, interesting uh, response from Tatiana. Uh, setting the uh, what is harm, uh, how we understand uh, and, and setting this. Uh, previously, Vakas mentioned the fear of AI. So uh, do we have any fear of uh, these things from technology uh, platforms like uh, yours? How, how you are handling this kind of uh, fear and risks uh, technologically? I don't know whether you uh, could be able to respond from technological side, but still uh, from your uh, platform perspective. I think, yeah, I mean, any new tech can seem scary, but I think we need to move beyond that. And like, yeah, as Tatiana and others mentioned, the existential risk always becomes a distraction in the conversation. I think there's like near short-term risks that uh, that need to be managed. Um, and on, there are approaches. I think there's some really good principles and frameworks out there with the OECD principles, um, you know, about fairness, about transparency, accountability, I mean, the White House commitments as well. So there are good policy frameworks for countries to look at, and they could certainly need to be localized to, to every region. Uh, but there's plenty of good examples, the G7, uh, uh, you know, Hiroshima process, that I think industry in generally has is supportive of, you know, uh, in terms of making sure that is that it, this that we make AI responsibly um, and for good. Um, but to me, I think the bigger question, the harms are 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 sort of clear. The idea uh, I think now is that how do we get this technology into the hands of more people? who are working in the cybersecurity space. Because if you think about cybersecurity space, also 20 years ago, it was quite closed. But now you have a lot more collaboration and open innovation happening in that. It took 20 years for us to realize that actually that keeping cybersecurity closed to a few does not help uh, because the bad actors get this stuff anyway, and then you just have like you're, you're defenseless against them. So I think the same thing has to happen with AI. It's going to be tough, but I think the governments and policymakers, if the they need to incentivize open innovation. So when you have a model that's closed, you don't know how it was trained, you don't know, you know how it was built, uh, you don't have a responsible, like it, it makes it difficult for, uh, you know, it's, uh, for this community to figure out what are the risks. And I think 
uh, you know, we, one of the things we did, for example, was we submitted our model. As our model is open source. It was launched um, just uh, in, in July of uh, this year. And, and already in one month, it was downloaded by 30,000 people. Now, our, of course, we did red teaming on it. We tested it for, but no amount of testing is going to be perfect. And the only way to, to get it per tested perfectly is to get it out there in the open source community and, and responsible players have access to it. They know what they're doing. And that's the beauty of AI. I think that's a game changer. Rakas mentioned that you know there's a capacity issue. Yes, there is a capacity issue. We have a capacity issue as Meta. You can't hire enough people to remove the bad content. AI helps us do that, right? You don't. So instead of having, I mean, you can have millions of people looking at what's on the p platform and removing content. It'll never be enough, right? AI helps us get better so that human. You still need human review. You still need experts to know what they're doing, but it helps them be more efficient and more effective. And the same thing, an open innovation model can help developing countries catch up on cybersecurity because now you don't need thousands and thousands of cybersecurity experts. You just need a few who have access to the technology, and that's what open innovation and open sourcing does, which is what we've done with our model. We even submitted our model to DEF CON, which is a cybersecurity conference in Las Vegas, and we said, you know, break this thing. Find the vulnerabilities. What are we not doing? Where, where are the risks? And we're waiting for the report, but that's how you get, make it better. Right? Uh, of course, we did our best to make sure that it takes care of the CBRN risks of you know, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear risks, but there are other risks that we may not have seen. So I think this is where putting it on open source, giving access to more researchers, it doesn't matter whether you're in Zambia or Pakistan or any other country, you have access to the same technology now that Meta has built. And that's how we get there to an open innovation approach. Um, there are many other language models, I'm not going to name them, but they are not open. List and metas is, so I think that's where we need to get policymakers to incentivize open hackathons on these kinds of things, break this thing, and create sandboxes to safely test this on, because a lot of the testing you can do is only based on what's publicly available. If governments have access to information that they can make available to hackers to say, okay, like use this language model and see if you can do this, and in a safe way environment, obviously, ethically, without uh, you know violating anybody's privacy and things like that. So I think that's, that's where we need to focus the discussion on policy. Thanks, uh, Sareem. Uh, I think <coughs> one interesting uh, issue is uh, we are uh, discussing from development country perspective, right? At the, uh, this is our basic objective, and uh, there are opportunities uh, to uh, all of uh, countries. Access is al always there, as you, uh, Sareem, mentioned. But uh, there are big gaps between uh, developing countries and developed countries about the capacity we, we have been talking about. And uh, especially if I see from Nepalese perspective, we have very uh, limited uh, resources, uh, technology, as well as human resource. That, that is a big challenge uh, on uh, this uh, defense. So, uh, Michael, uh, uh, what is your personal experience uh, leading from the, uh, from the front? And what is the capacity of uh, your team? And, and uh, uh, what do you see the gap between uh, developing countries and developed countries on, on uh, capacity of uh, addressing these issues? Uh, so basically, my experience is probably shared by all developing countries. We are consumers of services, products from developing countries. We haven't yet reached that stage where we can have our own homegrown solution to some of these AI model languages, where we can maybe localize it or train it on our own data sets. Whatever we are using or whatever is being used out there is a product of the Western world. So basically, one of the, one of the major challenges that uh, we've encountered through experience is that uh, the public availability of these language models in itself has proved to be a challenge in the sense that anyone out there can have access to the tools. It simply means that they can manipulate it to an extent for their criminal purposes. As reported by Meta, in the first quarter of the, their use of the language model that they are using, they got more close to a billion fake accounts. Am I correct? No, Closed. No, no, yeah. yeah uh, whatever. It could be images. It could be anything that was not meeting the standards of meta. So if you look at um, those numbers, those numbers are staggering. 
Now imagine some of the information that Meta has brought down because of ethical and uh, probably safety and other concerns were deployed to a third world country that has no single capacity to probably filter that which is correct, filter that which is not correct. It is becoming a challenge. As much as the crime trend is increasing, also with the borderless nature of the internet, the AI models have really become something that you have to weigh the good and the bad. Of course, the good outweighs the bad. But again, when the bad comes in, the damage it causes within a short period of time like outshines the good. So at the end of it all, there are many, many challenges that we faced through experience. Only if we could be at the same level with developing countries in terms of their tools they are using to filter anything that is probably will bring public opinions in terms of misinformation, in terms of hate speech, in terms of any other act that we may deem not appropriate for society or any other act that probably is a tool for criminal purposes. Thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, Vakas, would you like to uh, uh, intervene on this issue? I think, like already mentioned, um, uh, the pace with which um, the threats are evolving is, I think, unequal to, unequal to what, at, at the pace with which we are, our uh, defense mechanisms are improving. And why this is happening? This is because um, we don't have as much faster, the forensic, uh, for forensics is not as fast as, uh, as the crimes are happening. Like Michael has already mentioned, uh, this, it's a good thing that the tools or, the, or these models are open source, but at the same time, these models are equally available to people who want to misuse it as well. Now, the capacity of people who want to misuse it is sort of, when it outweighs the capacity of people who, has to, who have to defend against it, you, 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 you find incidents and you find, you find such situations where uh, we eventually say that, oh, look, AI is, you know, is, is bad for, for us or bad for the society and all. But when uh, we are better prepared, we are proactive, um, like, like Facebook, what Facebook did is sort of proactive thing, you know, rather than those accounts doing something, um, uh, doing something which would eventually become a big fiasco, they actually took it down before something would happen. That is something which developing countries are usually lagging behind doing cyber security or having their cyber defense uh, in a proactive mode uh, rather than being a reactive mode. I'm not saying that not prepared and I'm not saying that you know there is no proactive uh, approach there. There is, but that proactive approach is hugely dependent on what kind of tools and technologies and knowledge and resources and investment available to the developing countries um, rather than just saying that, you know, okay, fine, we are doing proactive approach and we're doing these things. I mean, Michael is at the forefront of everything. He would know um, that the kind of threats that are emerging now um, are much more sophisticated than they were ever before. But are we as sophisticated and as prepared as we were before? Uh, I leave that question to, on the table. Thank you. Can I just uh, add a perspective? Uh, yes, sure, sorry. Yeah, so I, I think I'm coming back to my introduction. I, I don't think the risk vectors have changed. It's, you know, oh, sorry, you want to add something? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, you might, as I said, the bad actors who want to cause harm are using the same vectors they were before Gen AI. I don't think, just because they're putting the, so it's like fishing, right? Like fishing is a good example. You don't solve for fishing okay, fine, they can have a much better email that's written that seems real and logos that look real and whatever, right? But, but that's not how you solve phishing. You solve phishing by making authentication credentials one-time use. Because any one of us, the most educated person in this room, can be phished, right? If, 
I mean, if you're, if you're running in a rush, you don't have time to check the email address, you, you just read look something, it looks real, you're gonna click on it. Yeah, we've all been there. We've all done it, right? I'm gonna raise my hand. So, so that threat vectors in, in terms of what you're talking about, it's just, it haven't changed, same with the fake accounts. So our fake account detection doesn't care what, how <laughs> real your photo is or isn't. It's based on AI, it's based on behavior. And that behavior, yes, of course, we, take, we have 3.8 billion users. We have to be careful that this is the spammy behavior we're seeing, people creating multiple accounts on the same device or sending 100 messages in a minute and spamming people and things like that. So it's really bad behavior. You, it doesn't matter what it is, it's wrong what country you're from, what culture you're from. Um, so that's the kind of stuff, it is universal, right? And same with phishing, it's quite universal. They, it's, they, they, so yes, the, there are certain risks, same with NCII. So NCII was still there before Gen AI, non-consensual intimate imagery. So you can use Photoshop for that, you don't need, you don't need Gen AI. And that's unfortunately, that's the biggest harm we see. That's the biggest risk, we talked about risk that we, and that's, that's a separate topic where I, I'm talking on a panel on child safety as well, where you need collaboration. We have an initiative called stopncii.org, where if you are a victim of NCII, and again, this is where AI helps. So if anyone is a victim, you know a victim of NCII, um, and they, their pictures have been compromised, and whoever is you know, blackmailing them and things like that, you can go to stopncii.org, and you can submit that video or image. And we use AI to block them across all platforms, all services. This is, where, this is the power of AI, right? Even if it's like slightly changed or, or because we take that hash and, and we, we do that. So it's, uh, this is the power of AI. I think it helps us with sort of preventing actually a lot of harm. Uh, whereas it would be, without AI, you can easily do the same thing. You know, it might make it a little bit easier or maybe it makes it high quality, but the quality of the, the impersonation or the quality of the attempt doesn't really change the, the risk vector. Tatiana, yeah. Yeah, thank you. What I wanted to say largely goes in line with what you say, because um, I, I made one line when I was listening. Um, misuse with, will always happen. We have to understand that we should stop fixating on technology itself. Any technology would be misused. If you want to create bulletproof technology, you should not create any technology because it, it will always be people who misuse it, who would find the way to misuse it. Crime follows opportunity. That's it. Any, any technology will be misused. And also about fishing, for example, the, the human is the weakest link always. You're not fooling the system only, you're fooling humans. And in the same way, we have to talk about harms. And, the, and, and the, here I go to one of my intro remarks. We have to focus on harms, not on technology per se. We have to see where the weakest link is, what exactly can be abused in, in terms of harms, where harm is caused. And in this way, I strongly believe that AI can bring so much good. And thank you for reminding me about the project of non-consensual image sharing. Of course. AI can, can do it automatically. You can compare hashes, you can have databases. But then again, when we look layer after layer, we can ask ourselves how this can be misused as well and how this can be addressed and so on and so forth. We just should always ask questions. And, 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 and also, I would like to remind again and again, it's not only about technology. Let's always remember that it is humans who are making mistakes and humans who are abusing this technology. And this is where we also have to build capacity, not only in technological development, not only in regulatory capacity, but after all, the whole chain of risk, uh, you know, focuses, focuses at the end on humans, on humans developing technology, on humans developing regulation, on humans being targeted, on humans making mistakes. And this is where we have to look at as well. Thanks, uh, Tatiana. Uh, now, um, I would like to open the floor and uh, if you have any uh, question, if uh, Ananda Gautam, my colleague, is uh, moderating online, and if there is any uh, question, if you uh, want to ask uh, to the panel from online as well, who are joining this discussion, you can also uh, put your question to the panel. And also, I'd like to uh, uh, request uh, uh, participants uh, to uh, speak or, or share your questions to the panel. Yes. Please uh, uh, introduce yourself briefly. Uh, 
for the record. Hello, everyone. I'm Prabhupada Subedi from Nepal. Um, it's been so interesting in discussion. Thank you so much, panel. Uh, I want to just um, explore a little bit what we miss from today's discussion, probably that is the capacity of uh, individual countries to negotiate with big tech players, right? If you look at the present scenario, uh, so much resources that is being collected from so-called third world, global south to the developed economy. And of course, they are boosting their econ economies through deploying this sort of technologies and we have nothing. And that is one of the main reason we are not empowered, we are not capable to tackle these sort of challenges. Uh, and of course, another thing is uh, the technology is so much concentrated uh, to the global north. And I'm not pretty sure that they do care uh, equally, inclusively to the big number of population living in the global south and economy comes first. So it will be continue what is happening today and will be continue in the AI time, AI dominated time, that is my Mm, observation and what is yours I would like to ask from panelist side. Any specific uh, resource person you would like to ask? Uh, anyone can. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think as, as I said before, I, I, first of all, I, I agree with you. There's a way of making technology more inclusive and that has to be by design. And that's why I think principles when it comes to the frameworks that are out there on AI, being led by Japan and OECD and the White House, they, it, it is about inclusivity, fairness. Uh, you know, making sure like it's not there's no bias in there. But those are all policy frameworks. I think from a tech perspective, as I said, I think open innovation is the answer, and AI can be the game changer. Where, uh, as I explained, it, it is out there. There's no reason why um, the same technology that we've open sourced that the Western countries have now, researchers and academics and developers in Nepal and other countries in Africa can also access. And this is an opportunity to get ahead. And it, you don't need, AI is, is, is the game changer because it's, it's about scale. It's about you know, doing things at scale and, and, and being able to, you know, especially if you think about systems and protecting systems and the threats you're talking about. You know, it, it's not a pro problem where you throw people at and it'll get solved. Of course, you need to do capacity building and you need experts. Uh, but um, it helps them be more efficient, more effective. So I'd love to see what the community, it's only a few months old, uh, our model. The, it's called Llama 2. Uh, you can go and, and look at it. You can look, there's a research paper along with it that explains how the model was built because we've made it, we've take, given an open source license under acceptable use policy. And so, um, yeah, and there's deriv derivatives already out of it. So you, you can't even use the language argument anymore because the Japanese took that model and they already made it into, they, they've, uh, they call it, uh, I think, ELISA, and the Japanese un university in Tokyo has made a Japanese version of that model. So it's, and we're excited to see what the community can do. And I think that's the way we can continue to innovate, make sure that nobody gets left behind. Uh, I do not completely agree with you because uh, you can already see that for example, Chat GPT uh, has the premium and free version, and the majority of users are from, of course, from the developed economies, and it's quite difficult to afford. And there is no always chance to be the openly and easily availability of such resources. And if, if you are not habited and if you are not well equipped with the resources, how can you be? capable to tackle the upcoming challenges in the future. So I don't work for ChatGPT or OpenAI, so I can't speak for them. But our model is open source. It's already public. And it's the same. And anyone can basically write another ChatGPT comp competitor using that. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Pravesh Ji. Um, Tatiana, he raised uh, uh, one uh, interesting uh, debate on Global North and Global South. Uh, 
Do you see? Uh, well, thank you very much. This is very interesting debate. And uh, as a student of international relations, I am Dr. Muhammad Shabir from Pakistan, uh, representing here civil society, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. So uh, the, the debate here going on, I sort of, as a student of international relations, uh, I would agree to this, that we don't live in, in an equal world. The terminologies, inclusivity, accessibility, they all seem very fine on the paper, but in reality, when we see what is happening here is, is unfortunately, we re live in a real world and not in an ideal world where everything would be equal uh, towards one another. Uh, Vakas raised a very uh, valid point, and I would ask, uh, want to ask that question from Vakas, and then I would seek the response from, uh, from Meta. Uh, you talked about the uh, transfer of technology. What sort of technology are you talking about here? And my question from Meta and, and the and Global uh, North is that how far are they ready to share that technology with the Global South? Uh, when, they, when it comes to diversity, inclusivity, not to talk of uh, the, the earlier point my friend raised about the, the price and the open and free plus uh, premium versions of different softwares that are out there in the market. Those will remain there, but what sort of technology are we talking about here in terms of transferring? Uh, of course, uh, AI would is a tool like any other tool, but I can see that when it was human against human, any so it would be like a sh like a sharp knife that could be used against any other person, but that would be human using against human, a tool. But this time, AI as a tool being used as a as not just as a computer, it would be a computer against a human who would be targeted. So the threat, as my friend from Meta is talking about, is, is just a real one, and it seems that it's, a, it's a, like a phishing one. The example cannot be equated. Uh, I think this is something that we need to discuss. The response measures have to be as sharpened, as quick, and as uh, faster as as the technology that we are developing here is. But I would want to uh, seek the response on my earlier point from Vakas and then from Meta. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think um, when when we when we say technology, um, it's primarily, of course, one of the examples is how Meta has just, just open sourced their AI AI model. Uh, which of course is is um, is something that f that any any nation can use to develop their own models. What we're talking about is a standardization of these technologies, in my view. Uh, once something gets standardized, uh, it is available to everybody. Um, that's how telecom infrastructure works, you know, uh, across the world. Um, if if some if 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 there is a standardized technology, of course, it is easier to for for uh, for developing countries or developed countries, anybody, any any uh, interested party to um, to take advantage of threat intelligence. What kind of threats are out there? What kind of issues are they dealing with? What kind of information sharing could be there? Um, what kind of new crimes are being uh, introduced? How AI is being misused? Uh, and then how it, that situation is being tackled by by the West. Um, technology itself is just a word. It is it is more about how what do, what are you sharing? Are you sharing information? Are you sharing the tools? Are you sharing experiences? Are you even sharing uh, human resources? You mentioned that now it is human versus AI, but can we? How about AI versus AI? You know, can we develop such tools or AIs uh, that can preempt and work? Like it's just like I'm 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 going back into the uh, into the cyber warfare movies and all that, which used to predict that in the, in the future bots would be fighting against each other. But we're not there yet. But um, if we are investing in AI for defense mechanisms, 
of to improve the cyber security posture like meta has just done um that investment muscle is currently not that much available to the developing countries so we have to look towards the west um and what they are developing is something that we need and we're going to need for uh, foreseeable future um in terms of the tools in terms of the information in terms of the experience sharing and in terms of the threat intelligence that they have thank you and i'll leave it to sarim to respond to the other part thank you vakas so i think it's a good question maybe i didn't set context of what llama 2 is so llama 2 is a large language model you know similar to open ai's chat gpt except the difference is it's free for commercial use and it's open source so the technology is available for any researcher anyone to deploy their own model within their own environment so you can put it on if you've got the computational power uh, you know in your own cloud you can deploy it there on your computer or you could deploy it on microsoft azure or aws and any other so it's basically uh, a large language model that helps you sort of perform those automate automated tasks but it's out there for open source meaning that it's you know we we invite the community to use it invite the community it's free we don't charge uh, there's no like paid version of it uh, for, obviously you have to agree to the conditions and uh, agree to the responsible use ai guide but beyond that um yeah that's what we've launched uh, just this year and we're excited to see how the community around the world in <laughs> uses it for different use cases and there are use cases we didn't even realize we that's the beauty of open source things like we won't know how it will get used by different governments by, by you know institutions to deploy uh of course we only make it better and safer through red teaming through testing on you know all that but the more cyber security experts tell us the vulnerabilities and use it that's how we'll we'll improve it thanks sir <clears throat> uh uh tatiana uh, observing these two questions uh, uh i i was supposed to ask you Uh, the uh, debate of global south and global north uh, capacity and the impact on uh, artificial intelligence and cyber defense issue um i must admit here that that i cannot speak for global south which is global majority right uh it is hard for me to assess capacity there but i can certainly tell you that even in the global north if we call it if we call the global minority global north uh the the artificial intelligence in cyber um, uh, so capacity in cyber defense uh on the one hand of course if we're talking about expertise we might talk about some high quality specialists and better testing and whatever but believe me the threat the threat is still there and the there is lack of understanding what kind of threat is there in terms of national security in terms of cyber operations um the because so much is connected in the global north because people follow things on the internet so much the question for example um deep fakes and elections and i love the story about nancy pelosi video because you don't have to change anything you you just have to slow down or speed up and whatever so the question here again boils down to capacity to assess the threats before you have capacity to 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 tackle them and i do believe that right now in the so called global north we have this problem as well capacity to understand the threat are we just saying oh my god it's happening or are we really kind of uh, disentangling it looking at what is actually happening and then assessing it and and i do believe that indeed indeed there is a gap when we say when when we talk about uh developing countries and developed countries in in technological expertise in what you can adopt in how you can address it but in terms of understanding the threat we still lack capacity in global north as well we still lack understanding of the threat itself and there is a lot of fear mongering go going on as well and um i do believe that in this term we have to share this knowledge we have to share this capacity because yeah the threat can be can 
vary from region to region, but at the same time, the harm will be to people, be it elections, be it cyber threats, be it, be it national security threats. And, and here I do believe that there is such a huge potential for cooperation between what you call global north and global south. And by the way, I do think that we have to come up with better terms. Thanks, Tatiana. I'll Thank come you. on uh, cooperation. Uh, I'll go to uh, the question. Um. Mm, thank you. Um, Introduce for yourself. Giving me the floor. Um, my name is Adam Ajalo. I'm coming from the Africa IGF as a MAC member. Um, very interesting session, really. I, I think um, when we talk about AI, most of the time it's us from the global south or developing um, countries have the most questions to ask because we have the bigger concerns. <coughs> we are still um, tagging along. Um, when it comes to AI, we are concerned about how inclusive it is and how accessibility it is. For example, coming from an African context, we are still struggling with the infrastructure. We talk about electricity, access to electricity. It's a problem. And you need to be online. You need to be connected to be able to utilize most of these facilities that comes with AI. But we are already having those challenges, so it's difficult for us to actually um, either follow the trend or keep up with the trend. So um, um, it always brings us to mind also as well, we have so many people that don't really have no access to internet. We don't even know what is digital. And uh, we talk about inclusion. How do we bring those people along? And how can they keep up with the whole idea? There is always a concern, um, what are the risks, what are the challenges, how do we move away from the status quo, how do we follow suit, and what, what are the risks for us? And usually what are the benefits we get? But then it comes back to understanding when it really draws back to digital literacy, how people are digitally literate to understand what are the risks and what the benefit uh, that might come from it and how we practically comes to come to, I would say, tag along with already the global not that are far ahead um, from where we are coming from. Um, there is always the issue of people trusting AI, you know, from where I'm coming from, people will ask, is AI here to take our jobs? You know, how much can we be dependent on AI and not really, would it balance how creative we are? Because some of the consumers, when you are a con consumer of AI, you are consuming. So does that really limit you being creative and also just being the consumer and just, you know, receiving and receiving and receiving and not also, you know, it limits how, how how can we balance the creativity of the human being. So it's it's a bit um, off balance, but it's good to um, bring this to the table to ensure that uh, when we are moving, there must be people left behind, but we see how to draw them along. And um, this is something that I just wanted to draw out there. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, anything uh, you would like to respond or... I have uh, one uh, important side of cooperation. The, uh, just we started about the global north and global south, and we're talking from a development country perspective and how uh, we can build up a cooperation on, on addressing at national, regional, and, and global level. So uh, what could be the uh, possible uh, framework for uh, addressing these issues? Tatiana? Sorry, um, I think that we already mentioned uh, the principles. Uh, and, and they are basically, okay, they're not that global, but I do believe that um, I, I, I absolutely love the previous intervention. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't catch the name, but I do think that there are so many. So if we look about principles um, of AI, like, for example, fairness, transparency, accountability, and so on and so forth. I think that we really need to redefine what fairness means. We really need to redefine what fairness means, because I think that right now when we are talking about fairness, we do talk about applicability of fairness to what you call global north. And I think that if we look at fairness much broader, it will include the use of technologies and the impact on this techno of these technologies to any part of the world, to any part of society. 
it is hard for me to think about cooperation on the global level. Like, you know, we all get together and happily develop something. I'm not sure this can happen, really, unless the threat is imminent. <laughs> but, but, yeah. So I do believe that we have to... When, when we think about global cooperation, when we think about global capacity building, we should not start from threats. We should start from building a better future. We should start from benefits. And I think that fairness would be the best way to start. How do we make technology fair? How do we make every community benefiting from this technology? I know that you probably want me to talk about more practical steps. Uh, I don't have, I, I be honest here, I do not have an answer to this question. Because unless we, we frame the place where we start from, which will include fairness for every country and every region and every user, instead of threats, instead of, oh my God, we are all going to die tomorrow from AI, or we are going to be insecure tomorrow. We should start with the benefit, how AI can benefit everybody, every population, every community, everyone. And if we start from the, from the premise of good and define it and somehow frame it, and it's already framed in a way, but you know, widen this frame. I think, I think starting there much, would be a much better place. And in terms of practical steps, I do believe that the steps, the baby steps are already taken by civil society, by the industry, which where certain players throw away the concept, move faster and break the things to the concept, let's go more open, more fair, more transparent, uh, more inclusive. This is already a good start. I do not know if, 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 if regulation, attempt to regulate would bring us there. I do not think so, actually. I think that attempts to regulate should go hand in hand in what we do as civil society, as, as technical community, as, as, as companies cooperating with each other. But to me, honestly, the first step would be to redefine the concept of fairness. I, I'd like to add one thing just to share with, with what just Tatiana has said. Um, she's spoken about global cooperation as well. I'd like just you know, like to take this from the other angle, which is reverse angle, which is starting from the national level. Um, information sharing, threat intelligence sharing, developing tools, mechanisms against, uh, you know, um, or, or using AI for cyber defense. That starting point is, of course, your national level policy, your national level initiatives, or whatever, whichever body that you have in your country. Um, for example, in Pakistan, we do have uh, such bodies. Now, on, on APAC level as well, there are bodies. For example, there is an, a, there is an Asia Pacific CERT as well. Uh, they do cyber drills. ITU also organizes cyber drills um, for countries to participate on and all. So there is some form of collaboration happening. Uh, how effective it is, I, I can't say for sure, um, because I th because this particular mix of AI into this uh, into this cyber security and cyber drills is something that which I haven't seen in any agenda so far. Um, but the starting point is again a discussion forum, like we are sitting at right now, like in IG for an, for a national cyber security dialogue to start which can then you know, uh, sort of meta size into, um, into a regional dialogue, which then eventually you know, uh, gives input to the global dialogue. Whether it's human, whether it's AI, whatever it is, the starting point of every solution is a dialogue, if in my opinion. So I think this is where collaboration comes in, this is where information sharing comes in, especially for the developing countries. Uh, if, it, if you don't have the tools or the technologies, technologies, at least what we have is each other to share information with. So I think that should be the starting point. Thank you. Thanks, Vakas. Uh, Michael, on cooperation. How, how we can build a cooperation uh, on cyber defense uh, and how what kind of strategies we can take on that? Uh, so basically, we've discussed a lot of issues, most of them We've looked at um, issues that have to do with fairness, accountability, and ethical use of the AI. There are many challenges that 
um, as a law enforcer, we face. But in all, this discussion would actually would definitely come in a broader way in the future when actually the law enforcers themselves start deploying AI to detect, prevent, and solve crime. Now that will affect all of us because at the end of it all, we are looking at AI being used by criminals to target probably individuals, to get money, probably to spread fake news. But now, imagine you are about to commit a crime and then AI detects that you're about to commit a crime. There's a concept of pre-crime. So that will affect each and every one of us. Just a simple show of behavior will detect what crime you'd want to commit or you commit in the future. So now that will bring up the issues of human rights, issues of ethical use, a lot of issues because at the end of it all, it will affect each and every one of us. Today we're discussing on the challenges that AI-driven defense system has brought, but, that, but in the future, not even in a, in a distant future, just probably in a few years' time, it will be something that all of us will have to probably face in terms of being judged, being assessed, being profiled by AI. So as much as we may discuss other challenges, let us also focus at the future when AI starts policing us. Thanks, Michael. One question from you. Yeah, question here. Come in, yeah, please. Mike there. Introduce, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the insightful reflection. This is Santosh Sigdal from Nepal, Digital Rights Nepal. Uh, on the question of uh, collaboration, I think uh, Tatiana said that we have to define the concept first. I think we have to also define the concept of cyber defense. Uh, if we are moving from cyber security to cyber defense, we have to uh, have a kind of open discussion because defense is uh, the job of government. Uh, and uh, normally government, national security, security, defense, they are dominant actor. And they do not want to uh, have other actors on the table the, citing national security. It has happened in lots of other issues, be it freedom of expression, be it uh, uh, other uh, civil rights. So national security is kind of domain, their domain, government domain. And we are talking that promoting cyber defense, not cyber security, in developing countries. So within the development, uh, uh, developing countries, we are empowering whom? We are empowering the government, we are empowering the civil society, we are empowering the tech companies, which stakeholder we are talking about. So I think we have to deconstruct the, the whole concept of cyber defense, and at the same time, uh, we have to uh, kind of deconstruct developing countries. Talking about within the developing countries, in the AI regulation, or uh, uh, we also talked about uh, AI regulation, and in the, in the uh, discussion of cyber defense, are the civil society now on the table to discuss these issues? I'll give you one example. In Nepal, recently Nepal formed the, uh, Nepal adopted the national cyber security policy. And one of the provision in the cyber security policy is that the technology or the consultation, ICT related technology or consultation would be procured by the different system than the existing public procurement process and that process will be defined by the government. So now they are having a new shield or the new layer where the public, uh, public or the civil society would not be discussed what kind of technology government is importing into the country or what kind of consultation they are having on the cybersecurity issues. So while talking about these issues, I think we have to also, another factor is we have to uh, discuss about the capacity of the government to implement it. whether that kind of defense or the capacity we are talking about, whether other governments are supporting them, is it available within the national context, or whether there is a geopolitics in the play. Because it has happened in many situations, cyber defense is part of the geopolitics as well. So we have to also consider that dimension. So in my opinion that the, you said earlier, yeah, technology is different, but the values are same. So we have to focus on the values. 
And I think the uh, Human Rights Charter or the Internet Right and Principles uh, are the basic values that we have to uphold. We are talking about different. Uh, Sabi Bhai earlier said about the, those values having in the paper and those values having in the practical world. Uh, at least to start, we have to, we have to I think, uh, start with the values that we have already agreed on, all we have agreed on the paper, then we have to make them practical in the, uh, in the real life. Thank you. Thank you. We have just eight minutes left. Uh, can you please briefly share your thoughts? Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Yasmin from the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. So I just have a quick question. So. Um, for, for, for based on my previous, I've been following the issue of AI and cybersecurity for a few years now, and I see that while both fields are so inherently deeply interconnected, fact is that at the multilateral level, other than processes like the IGF, and even so, it's only been recent, most of the deliberations are done in silo. You have processes for cyber, you have processes on AI, but they don't really interact with each other. So, but at the same time, I see that there is increased awareness on in, in like on making you know on coming up with governance solutions that are sort sort of multidisciplinary and l touch upon tech altogether and one of the approaches that have been um, proposed is responsible behavior and as states are trying to develop their national security strategies along the lines of responsible behavior on the using these technologies I was wondering if all the panelists, based on your respective areas of work, whether it's in the public or private sector, if you have any sort of best practices that you would recommend or you would be sharing um, to the audiences here on, yeah, when states are trying to develop their national security strategies, what sort of best practices have worked on your experience to govern these technologies in the, in the security and defense sector? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, question, but we have very uh, less time. We have just uh, six minutes left. A very uh, quick intervention from Michael and, and uh, so take away from all the panelists. Yeah. Uh, so basically to probably just touch a bit of what she's asked. So in integrating um, AI in the, into the defense system, of course she's mentioned issues of national cybersecurity strategies. There's also need for regulatory frameworks there's also need for capacity building, collaboration, data governance, incident response, and ethical guidelines, of course, within the international cooperation. So as she's put it, we are discussing two important issues in silos. Cybersecurity is discussed as a standalone topic without due consideration for AI. The same way AI is discussed in isolation without due consideration for cybersecurity and its impact. So there should be a point at which we must discuss the two as a single subject based on the impact and uh, the problems we are trying to solve. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Tatiana, closing remarks? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to address this question because to me it's a very interesting one as somebody who is to dealing with law and policy and UN process. Well, first of all, I think that this is not the first time when two uh, interrelated processes are artificially separated in the UN. For example, look at look at cybersecurity and cybercrime process. They are also separated, and then we have cybersecurity and AI and so on and so forth. As to best practices, I do. I, I, I will be honest here as well. I do not think that there are best practices yet. We are still building our capacity to address the issues. I would say that the, the things where I'm looking at to become best practices, there are quite a few. Uh, first of all, when we are talking about guiding principles, I, I believe that they are nice and good whenever they appear, but they do not tell you how achieve, to achieve transparency, how to achieve fairness, how to achieve accountability, really, in a way. So I'm, I'm currently looking at the Council of Europe uh, proposal for global treaty on AI, and I think that this might be the, it's, it's, it's very kind of general as a framework, but this might be a game changer for, from the human rights perspective, which will play into fairness perspective in terms of agreed values. But I'm also looking to the EU AI Act, because this is where we might get a point where on the regulatory, regulatory level, we will prohibit profiling and some other AI uses. And this might be a game changer, and this might become the best practice. And, 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 and this is what I would be looking at, not at the UN, but on the EU level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sadi? 
Thanks, Babu. Yeah, I think certainly you're right. It's um, still early days, right? I mean, there's we you know, met as a member of the partnership Sony AI with other industry players, and there's, I think, multi-stakeholder collaboration. I know it's been mentioned in every session. Is that is the solution? And I think there are good examples in terms of north stars to look at in other areas. So, for example, you take child safety or you take terrorism. You know, um, the AI is already doing some pretty advanced uh, defensive stuff there on both fronts, right? So on, on child safety, um, the National Center for Missing and Exploitative Children, like that, they have a cyber tip line where they inform law enforcement in different countries uh, based on CSAM that's detected on platforms. And that's because industry, that's a public-private partnership becomes very key there, where industry works with them and you know, they, they enable law enforcement in, in around the world in that issue of child safety and child exploitation. So that's a good example of where we can get to on cybersecurity. Same with terrorism. Um, you know, the GIF-CT uh, is a very important forum that uh, uh, where industry is a part of and, and, uh, and where we ensure that, you know, platforms are not used to... So I think back to the harms, like we have to know what is the harm we're trying to attempt and do we have the right people focused on it? But I think on the AI front there, we're in the beginning of the stages of getting... We need to have technical standards built uh, like we do on other areas, like things like, okay, watermarking, you know, what does that look like for audiovisual... Uh, content, uh, and that can be fixed on the production side, right? Uh, if, if everybody <laughs> has this consensus, not just in industry, but across countries and including countries in developing countries. Um, but I do think the opportunity in the short term is for developing countries to take advantage of the incentivize, you know, like we have a bug bounty program, for example, um, but incentivizing, giving data to local researchers and developers to help figure out vulnerabilities and, and train systems using that for your purposes locally is, is sort of the immediate opportunity because these models are open source now and available. Thanks, uh, Sarim. Uh, Vakas, just we have uh, one minute left. Okay, one, one minute. I think we look at the government to do most of the things, um, almost everything, but this weight of responsibility to be more cyber ready uh, has to be distributed not only just between the government, but also among the users, among the platforms, among the academy, everybody. Like, I'm circling back to the multi-stakeholder model that we have and the collaborative approach that we always follow. I think if if we all, if we cannot, if, the, if in the developing countries we cannot have the capacity or the technology to handle these challenges, um, so far at least what we do have is um, is, is, is a share of responsibility uh, that maybe all of us can have um, and, you know, make sure that, you know, we we are at least in somewhat ready to address these challenges being posed by AI and cybersecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Vakas. Uh, we uh, completed this discussion uh, exactly on time. I'd like to thank all of you. A uh, couple of things were very uh, significantly we discussed. Uh, one is identifying harm. And the uh, another was uh, the capacity, and uh, of course uh, these are uh, two major things. Uh, and uh, without uh, uh, taking more time for another session, uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, our speakers, our online moderator, our uh, audience uh, from uh, uh, online platform, and of course all of you at a very late evening uh, session in Kyoto uh, IGF. Thank you very much. I uh, conclude this session here now. Thank you very much.